Western hurricane in recorded history on the move, heading straight toward Turks and Caicos and the Bahamas at this hour. This after hammering St. Martin and rocking the Caribbean, leaving unprecedented damage. And unfortunately, nine people so far are dead. The 185 mile per hour catastrophic winds also whipping Puerto Rico, knocking out power, thousands now in the dark. The monster storm's eye now staring directly at the state of Florida, forcing brand new evacuation orders on this Thursday morning. President Trump is vowing his administration is ready. We're getting ready to respond to Hurricane Irma. We'll work together to help save lives, protect families, and support those in need. Well, for every angle of this storm, we've got Janice Dean. She kicks off our team coverage and is tracking Hurricane Irma's latest path. Good morning, Janice. Good morning. Yeah, we're going to be watching the storm well into next week, it looks like. And I just want to point out, we have two other hurricanes we are monitoring, Jose and Katia in the Gulf of Mexico. Both of those storms not going to impact the U.S. right now. So the last 12 hours, it thankfully, the worst of the storm, the worst of the winds and the rain and the storm surge just went north of Puerto Rico. That's great news for them. The Dominican Republic uh, also hates watching the storm very carefully but you can see there's the eye right now still a category 5 storm the fact that we have seen this strength last for days is unprecedented and it is just a monster you've got the buzzsaw look right here all four quadrants are filled out a lot of warm water ahead of this not much to tear the storm apart as it moves towards the Turks and Caicos and the Bahamas very concerned for these low-lying islands they're just going to potentially be devastated so here's your future radar again going through Turks Caicos Bahamas and then we watch South Florida and the Keys that's when things get a little bit interesting because the computer models don't quite know what to do. Does a trough pick up the storm? What is the timing on the trough? Is the high pressure in the Atlantic still very strong? So some of those questions still yet to be determined. So very good agreement as we head out to Saturday, Sunday, obviously coming too close for comfort for Key West, the Keys, South Florida. But watch these computer models, guys. Very good agreement as we get into Saturday, Sunday. But then there's a huge spread, and that's why that cone of uncertainty goes up the state of Florida. But now we have to watch Georgia and the Carolinas, because if this storm stays offshore, it doesn't get torn apart, and we could be potentially dealing with a major hurricane for the southeast coast. So a lot to determine. We will certainly keep you posted. Listen to your local officials. Please listen to your local officials and your local forecasts. But definitely going to make landfall on the U.S. according to those models, correct? We will definitely see impact, the exact location and the timing still yet to be determined. One of those models shows it going to Tennessee. The storm is a rainmaker, goes to Tennessee. Well, absolutely. If it makes impact here, yeah. it's going to go right into Tennessee mm -hmm. and bring heavy rainfall. When's the last time that happened? Wow. Wow. That is just crazy. We've also just heard the death toll is now at 10, Janice, and one of those is an infant, a baby. Right. I'm nervous that the death toll is going to continue to rise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right, thank uh, JD, much. thank you. Appreciate it. Well, as Hurricane Irma's path of destruction intensifies, Florida is now ramping up evacuations. It's a race against the clock for millions in the storm's deadly path. Jillian picks up our live team coverage. She's in Miami Beach where people are leaving everything behind and hitting the road. And uh, if they can get gas, Jillian, they do. And the good news for the folks at that gas station is the big truck filling up the gas station is right behind you. Yes, and guys, so we've been here live for an hour now, been on location for about an hour and a half. People have been here for hours waiting, and just literally six minutes ago, this truck pulled up. You would have thought it was Christmas out here, and it was little kids, because that's how excited everyone was. Everyone cheered, they clapped. This is Keith. He is obviously hard at work right now. Keith is the hero of the day as far as everyone at this gas station is concerned. I mean, as I mentioned, they've been here waiting for hours. As you can see, this gas station is already boarded up, like most places down here. And let's come over right now to Bianca and Elizabeth. Elizabeth, hey. you were one of the first. You, you noticed the truck. You were yes. clapping. Yes. You were yes. cheering. How do you yes. feel? Oh, much better now. It was like better than hitting the lotto. <laughs> really? Oh, yes. Did you guys right at all, now, Bianca, yes. think there was a point where you may not get gas? Yeah, we were already thinking of like an alternative, which is just to Uber all the way to Dania Beach so that we would just leave our car here because we don't have enough gas to go. But once it arrived, I've never been so happy to see gas in my entire life. Like, <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. And this is your first hurricane you're experiencing in this area. You're getting out of town. Are you going to stay with family, with friends? What's the plan? With friends. Yeah, we're going to be staying with friends. Uh, they're going to kind of guide us through the first hurricane. So we'll feel a little bit better once we get up there. Okay. Well, guys, I'm very happy to share this Thank moment you. with you because they have been here waiting since 2, 2.30 this morning. 
you. So definitely a lot of happy campers out here, but that's not the same all across the area. And we'll have live reports for you throughout the morning. I'll send it back to you. All right, Jill. Thank you Thank very you much. A lot. It reminds you the basic stuff you take for granted. Moments like this, moments yeah. of crisis, suddenly become something you'll go to a gas station at 2.34. So true. And, and we're all pulling for them. I was watching Jillian doing her live shots, the 5 a.m. show, and she interviewed them. And they said they, t- they were told by the gas station attendant yesterday to come back at 3 a.m. Right. So they got there at 2.30. Here it is, 6 o'clock in the morning, and they're finally getting their gas. Well, they're just, thrilled. just think about it. If an evacuation is ordered for where they're at, and so far the, they have ordered some along the coast, coastal areas, including, I believe, Miami Beach, there are essentially two major roads yeah. out of yes. South Florida mm-hmm. up north. And the 95 key, and 10? And right? the key is just to outrun the wind, mm-hmm. they think. But really, it's the storm surge you got to worry about. Yeah. Well, so. the, the governor of that great state of Florida, he said, we can rebuild homes, we cannot rebuild your family. So there is Irma, and it looks like it's headed. Florida will be impacted. The question is, how much? We're going to be following it throughout the morning. In the meantime, let's uh, talk about the big political story, and this is it. It was a political explosion yesterday. <laughs> the president of the United States, a Republican, made a deal with the Democrats. Uh, that's the headline. The president overruled his Treasury Secretary and the uh, the congressional leadership on the Republican side who wanted a debt ceiling increase and fund the government and to get $8 billion for Harvey. Uh, They wanted it to go pa- the uh, limit to go past next year's midterm elections. The kick Democrats the can, just, they want to kick it all the way down. Yeah, right. <laughs> Democrats just wanted three months. And you know what? The president, not wanting to fight, apparently said, that's the deal I'm going to take right now because we've got tax reform and other stuff we got to do right now. Good for right. him. He's doing this for the folks that are affected by Harvey. I remember originally he said he was going to give, it was like $5.95 billion to the folks in Texas. And then we had, I think, Chris Christie on the on the couch and or some, one of the, one, one leader, another governor who said that's not enough money he needs to give more now he's giving eight billion to help those families and it's great well some some conservatives are upset uh because they want they big want time big time but you know what this is a clear shot at mitch mcconnell and paul ryan hey guys if you kind of can't get things done then I, listen i'll go work with the democrats sure and i'll work with the things like raising the debt ceiling and the continued resolution to fund the government and irma listen democrats are always happy to spend your money and they're always happy to, to raise your debt ceiling and do those types of things. So they're happy to come to the table. But I think it's very strategic from this president. Clear out the underbrush of the stuff that could be contentious, that Washington likes to fight about, so you can clear the deck to fight for the stuff that really matters. Mm-hmm. Now he's got real right. leverage with DACA on the wall, right. which he really what yeah. he wants, and tax reform, and maybe one more shot at repeal and replace Obamacare. That's what the president really wants. Get the sure. other stuff Isn't out of Isn't it refreshing way. to see them work together, though? I, don't, I think it's, they're using each other at this moment. Absolutely, but isn't that the art of the deal? Isn't that, that what they do? It's the art of the dams. Here's the thing, and, and there you can see the president and Chuck Schumer uh, locked in a conversation right there. What exactly did the president sign up for? Mm-hmm. A three-month extension of the debt limit. It's not like he's signed it away for the next 20 right. years. It's a short-term deal. But here's the soundbite of the president last night in North Dakota where he did do a pitch for tax reform talking about how sometimes you've got to reach across the aisle and pull those guys over to your side. Watch. Prior to leaving the White House, I had a great bipartisan meeting with Democrat and Republican leaders in Congress, and I'm committed to working with both parties to deliver for our wonderful, wonderful citizens. It's about time. We had a great meeting with Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, and uh, the whole Republican leadership group. And I'll tell you what, we walked out of there, Mitch and Paul and everybody, Kevin, and we walked out and everybody was happy. Not too happy, because you can never be too happy. But they were happy enough. And it was nice to see that happen for a change, because that hasn't happened for a long time in this country, for a very long time. Quick, a quick note, the president will be having dinner tonight with Paul Ryan. Well, that's going to be great. In the White House, so that will be an interesting conversation. <laughs> let, us know what you, yeah. let us know what you think about this. Do you like the president working with the Democrats? We'd love to see those emails. Uh, the president himself was in North Dakota, as I mentioned ago, talking about tax reform. Here he is pitching lower taxes for everybody. Our country and our economy cannot take off like they should unless we reform America's outdated complex and extremely burdensome. I mean, this is so complicated and so burdensome, our tax code. If we want to renew our prosperity, restore our opportunity, and reestablish our economic dominance, which is what we should be doing, then we need tax reform that is pro-growth, pro-jobs, pro-worker, pro-family, and yes, pro-American. My administration is working with Congress to develop a plan that will deliver more jobs, higher pay, lower taxes for businesses of all sizes and middle-class families 
all across the nation. So it's not only business taxes, it's middle income families, it's families at every level, every level, tax cuts. That's a winning message. That's a message if, if that can resonate and poke through, sure. even Democrats might be forced. That's why Heidi Heitkamp was on stage with them and he, he brought her up on stage. He said, You're, you might be asking, why is she up here with us? She's the one on the far right. And he said she she supports tax reform, just like the most people in this in the state of North mm -hmm. Dakota. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great to see them all working together. I think this well, is wonderful. It is. But you look at what the president has accomplished with Congress thus far. He did not have one legislative win, really, any of the big stuff, thanks to any of the Republicans. This morning, he actually has something accomplished with help from the Democrats. And he thinks that this opening is an opportunity on what he really wants, mm -hmm. what he ran on. And that is building at least a portion of the wall. And so on his side, he wants the wall. On the Democratic side, they want the dreamers to stay. Here's the president on perhaps a deal on DACA. Congress, I really believe, wants to take care of the situation. I really believe it. We discussed that also today. Uh, and Chuck and Nancy would like to see something happen. I'd like to see something where we have good border security and we have a great uh, DACA transaction where everybody is happy and now they don't have to worry about it anymore. I'd like to see a permanent deal and I think it's going to happen. It really could. Two things in this. Heidi Heitkamp's approval rating is 32 percent. So this right. is brass tax politics. She needs him. She needs him. And then on the on the DACA deal, why not? Get a wall that's permanent and funded, mm -hmm. which is his key ca campaign promise he says, for the Dreamers. I'll give you what you want. Dreamers can stay, Democrats. You give me what I want. I want the wall. Hey, but he does, he, he's not even asking for all the money for the wall. He just wants under $2 billion to start the wall. It's a I symbolic see. thing. So we'll, see, we'll see if that happens. And we'll see if other Democrats come on board like Heidi Heitkamp has. All right. Uh, meanwhile, he's the IT staffer for the DNC and Debbie Wasserman Schultz, accused of stealing American secrets and hiding out in Pakistan. But this morning, a major update. He's coming back to America. Plus, critics love to blame President Trump for the political divide. But is it really a trend that's been growing for decades? Lee Carter's here with a history lesson for us. Coming up next. A stunning new survey showing the political divide in this country has been growing for decades. It's not just now. As this graph shows, the approval rating for presidents by their opposing party has been dropping since the 1950s. See, over on the far left, that's Eisenhower. On the far right, that's President Trump. 60% of Democrats approved of the job Eisenhower was doing eight months into his presidency compared to just 8% of Democrats who approve of President Trump today. So what does it mean? What is going on? Don't ask me. Let's ask her, pollster Lee Carter, the president and partner of Ms. Lansky and Partners. All right, Lee, as you as you look at the, yeah. the scale over there, you can see that it really fell off the cliff during the Bill Clinton years. I mean, George Herbert Walker Bush was very popular with the opposing party. What happened to Bill Clinton that has sustained to this day? So you can see what's really changed is the way we frame and the way we view the world. It used to be that when you were having a conversation with somebody of a different political party, you would say, I think we both want what's best for America. What I believe as a Democrat is I think that the government should provide programs to make things better. Republicans would say, listen, I want to give tools to the individuals in government to be out of my business. And you could have a debate and you could disagree and, and say, we both want what's best for us. What ended up happening is that it became a value judgment. So right. it, used to, it became framed as, for Democrats, we're the party that cares about people. Republicans, you don't. And then the Republicans started to say, we care about freedom. And if you oppose us, then you must hate freedom. Sure. And so now it became something that's very, very personal and, and, and very, very moral, very, very right. visceral. It, it goes to the core. And here's a uh, quote from uh, this Market Walk story uh, summarizing. Democrats are twice as likely to say they never go to church as Republicans and are eight times as likely to favor action on climate change. One third of Republicans say they support the NRA, while just four percent of Democrats do. So it's the way people are wired this, these days, right? It's the way people are wired. And when you look at it, there's, this, there's a, something called the moral values theory. They say Demo Democrats primary value is all about care. Mm -hmm. And so when you see that play out with they're DACA and immigration, they're care. wired towards care. And you're saying that we are supposed to, as government, provide care for those people. And if 
you're against us, you must hate people. You must be anti-people and somehow evil. Now, on the Republican side, we've, we frame a lot of things around freedom, liberty, and all of those kinds of things, and choice. And so when, Democrat, when we go against Democrats, we're saying, then you must hate freedom. You mm -hmm. must hate choice. And so what ends up happening is we're at a gridlock, and we absolutely can't compromise because we're saying that it's a value judgment against each other rather than a difference in opinions. So if uh, you hear commentators talk a little bit about how things have never been this bad, it's been a long time coming to where we are today. It sure has. And you can see the difference in issue by issue, whether it's immigration, the way you look at the future, it's all tied into your political beliefs. All right. Lee Carter, we thank you very much for joining us live today. Great to be here. All right. So what do you think about that? Share your thoughts. Foxandfriends.com. Meanwhile, he's a Marine general who lost his son in Afghanistan, but one Democratic congressman calls General John Kelly a disgrace to the uniform because of the decision on DACA made by his boss. Jim Hansen served in the U.S. Army Special Forces and as, as a message for that congressman coming up next. Plus, target, the terrorists targeting the food at your grocery store. some quick headlines for you. North Korea vowing, quote, powerful countermeasures after the United States asked the U.N. to freeze all of dictator Kim Jong-un's financial assets. This comes as the rogue nation is expected to test launch another missile on Saturday after already detonating a hydrogen bomb last week. In response, South Korea has finished installing its missile defense system known as THAAD and is developing what is called the Franken missile, which is designed to destroy North Korea's underground bases. Also, ISIS wants to launch terror attacks on supermarkets. The extremist group reportedly urging followers to inject food with cyanide at grocery stores across the U.S. and Europe. Pretty scary. Pete? Wonderful. Thanks, Ainsley. Well, listen to this story. Democratic Congressman Louis Gutierrez, Louis Gutierrez, slamming